Welcome to Lecture 4 on Civil Rights. We left off talking about the Montgomery boycott and King's success at uh, drawing it to a you know, successful conclusion. King's remarkable voice became familiar to the entire nation, drawing on sources as diverse as Gandhi and Henry David Thoreau, King came out of the bus boycott with a concept of passive resistance. If cursed, he told the protesters in Montgomery, do not curse back. If struck, do not strike back, but evidence love and goodwill at all times. The essence of his strategy was to turn the apparent weakness of Southern blacks, their lack of power, into a conquering weapon. He had hoped to use nonviolence to appeal to middle-class white America, quote, to the conscience of the great decent majority who through blindness, fear, pride, or rationality have allowed their consciousness to sleep, end quote. I've included two videos about the Montgomery uh, boycott and other boycotts and a short clip on the influence of David Thoreau in uh, this week's lecture. So please take time to uh, peruse those and because uh, they're very enlightening. Um, gaining the right to fully participate in the election process was a key step in realizing full equality in the United States. Central to the African-American struggle for civil rights was securing their full political citizenship with the 15th Amendment has secured only imperfectly. States continue to restrict access to the ballot box through a number of ways other than openly racial disenfranchisement. Southern civil rights activists had struggled to explain black voting participation against the excessively onerous and obstructive voter registration requirements, literacy tests, poll taxes, and threats of murder and violence. In the summer of 1964, the leading civil rights organizations joined together in a mutual Freedom Summer initiative in which volunteers from across the nation, including a lot of students from northern colleges on their summer break, walked from home to home to register voters and to break the pattern of repression and intimidation. Now, the murder of three volunteers by local police and Klan members near the town of Philadelphia, Mississippi, only intensified the national outrage over Southern Jim Crow laws and strengthened the resolve of grassroots activists. Now, the president at the time, Kennedy, faced a dilemma over civil rights. Despite his lack of a strong record in the Senate, he had portrayed himself during the 1960 campaign as a crusader for African American rights. He promised to attack segregation in the Deep South, but his fear of alienating Southern Democrats forced him to downplay civil rights legislation. The president's solution was to defer congressional action in favor of executive leadership. A pattern of belated reaction to Southern racism marked Kennedy's basic approach. President John F. Kennedy urged Congress to enact comprehensive civil rights bills and his assassination added political fuel to the drive for decisive federal action. Linda B. Johnson quickly filled the vacuum left by Kennedy's death. Asking Congress to enact Kennedy's tax and civil rights bills as a tribute to the fallen leader, LBJ concluded, quote, let us here highly resolve that John Fitzgerald Kennedy did not live or die in vain, end quote. Despite solid majorities in both houses, including 70 first-term Democrats who had ridden into office on his coattails, Johnson knew he would have to enact the great society as swiftly as possible. Quote, doesn't matter what kind of majority you come in with. You've got just one year when they treat you right and before they start worrying about themselves. End quote. Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and LBJ signed it into law. It strengthened the voting rights provisions of earlier Civil Rights Act. The act also stated that public, public accommodations could not be segregated. It ended segregation in schools. The act also made it illegal to discriminate in the hiring, promoting, and firing 
of employees. The law forbids discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or nationality. It was a monumental legal change in providing equal protection under the law. The 1964 Civil Rights Act declared discrimination by school boards illegal and created administrative agencies to help the courts implement laws against it. Of the various parts of the act, we have Title IV of the act authorized the executive branch through the Justice Department to implement federal court orders to desegregate schools. Title VI became the most effective weapon for desegregating schools outside of the South because segregation in northern city school districts was more subtler and more difficult to address. Outside the South, the instruments of segregation including such practices as redlining, through which banks declined to offer mortgages in black neighborhoods. This led to school district boundaries that were seemingly neutral, but were actually conforming to segregated neighborhood patterns. These practices often resulted in de facto segregation without a clear legal or de jure basis. In order to discriminate, eliminate discrimination, the 64 Civil Rights Act gave the President, through the Office of Civil Rights, the power to withhold federal education grants. It gave the Attorney General the power to initiate lawsuits whenever there was a pattern or practice of discrimination. In the following decade, the Justice Department made particular effort to desegregate America's public schools. It sued more than 500 school districts, while other federal administrative agencies sued 600 districts, threatening to suspend federal aid unless real segregation, desegregation steps were taken. In 1971, the Supreme Court ruled that state-imposed desegregation could be achieved through busing. The decision also allowed for racial quotas in limited circumstances. Three years later, however, this principle was severely restricted. The court determined that only districts found guilty of deliberate and de jure racial segregation would have to desegregate their schools. This effectively exempted most northern states and cities from busing. The whole concept was you would bus African Americans from one district to a predominantly white district to further integrate the um, school system. Outlawing discrimination in employment. Progress in the right to participate in politics and government dramatized the relative lack of progress in the economic domain. The federal courts and the Justice Department entered this area through Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Title VII outlawed job discrimination in all private and public employers, including government agencies that employed more than 15 workers. Title VII delegated some of the powers to enforce fair employment practices to the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division and others to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the EEOC. By executive order, these agencies had the power to revoke or prohibit federal contracts for goods and services with any private company that could not guarantee that its rule for hiring, promotion, and firing were non-discriminatory. In 1972, President Nixon and a Democratic Congress cooperated to strengthen the EEOC by giving it authority to initiate suits rather than having to wait for grievances to be filed.